Hello, I'm Arpana Agrawal, presenting the update for the PGC's Substance Use Disorders Group on behalf of my co-chairs, Howard Edenberg and Joel Glunter. I'll start by thanking our group for sharing their data and their expertise, and to NIDA for supporting our working group. Since we saw you in Anaheim last year, a lot has changed. Within the PGC Substance Use Disorders Group, we had a very productive year. I'm going to go over our progress timeline on the next slide. It will include QR codes to our papers, so if you would like to grab a cell phone to register those, now would be a good time to do so. We started 2020 with two major publications, one in Nature Neuroscience and another in Molecular Psychiatry. The first, a collaboration led by the Million Veteran Program with PGC investigators, identified 29 loci, several of them novel, in the current largest GWAS of problematic alcohol use. Second, the SUD group published a large GWAS of opioid use disorder, specifically drawing contrast between loci identified when comparisons were made to opioid exposed versus unexposed controls. The largest cannabis use disorder GWAS, a collaboration led by PGC with iPsych and Decode, will also be published in an upcoming issue of Lancet Psychiatry. We have a couple of other preprints out there. Notably, one of our analysts supported by substance use disorder, as well as other PGC investigators, provided strong analytical counterpoints to a recent genetic test for opioid use disorder which was highly confounded by population stratification. In other words, this test comprised of 16 candidate variants did not predict opioid use disorder status in any way once genetic ancestry was properly modeled. We showed that these sorts of tests are flawed, are likely to exacerbate existing prescribing bias and further stigmatize certain populations. Now, one consistent finding from our work is that the use of substances like alcohol genetically differs from misuse and problems related to those substances. And this year, we extended that finding to cannabis. It was interesting to note similarities. For instance, based on the largest study of alcohol consumption and smoking that's shown here, we note that typical drinking or drinks per week denoted by the column labeled ALK on your slide is genetically uncorrelated with psychiatric disorders. On the other hand, alcohol use disorder is genetically correlated with psychiatric disorders, and so are cannabis use and cannabis use disorder, shown by CUD. So in that regard, cannabis use differs from typical drinking in that it does relate to psychiatric illness. But when you examine genetic correlations with psychosocial behaviors, like years of education, and age at first birth, you see that while alcohol use disorder and cannabis use disorder correlate with liability to fewer years of education and lower age at first birth, cannabis use shows the opposite relationship. Collectively, these analyses show that individual substances differ in how they genetically relate to other domains, but also that use and misuse should not be genetically confounded. We have several exciting analyses coming your way, including three or four cross-disorder analyses with other PGC groups. A majority of these projects are being led by young investigators supported on their own training and career development grants. Just briefly, we want to share one exciting finding that should be out as a preprint in the next couple of months. Using genomic SEM, we identified a single genomic factor underlying alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and opioid problem use and use disorder while accounting for genetic variants due to the use of these substances. We also linked this genetic liability to common addictions to the three non-substance psychiatric disorder clusters from the cross-disorder paper that was published in Cell. The mood and psychotic disorder cluster appeared as most interesting in its relationship with this common addiction liability. And if you didn't get a chance, Dr. Alex Hatoum provides other cool details about this analysis in his ECIP talk 
that was part of the Substance Abuse Symposium on Monday, October 19th. As we head into PGC4, we have three specific requests from our worldwide collaborators. We continue to seek data for substance use disorder cases. We are particularly interested in samples with female cases and those that are ancestrally diverse. Our data are currently skewed towards males and we are eager to prioritize sex specific analyses in diverse ancestral populations. Second, and always, if you have item level data or age of onset information, we would like to work with you to circumvent heterogeneity and fine tune our causal analyses. As you well know, substance use disorders are central to many of the classic causal hypotheses in psychiatry, cannabis and schizophrenia, alcohol and depression, and these data on age of onset are necessary to disarticulate causal and correlational hypotheses. Finally, any comorbidity data would be very helpful, especially if your disorder of interest includes comorbid substance use disorders. You can join our working group at any time by contributing data. Just email Howard, Joel, or myself, and our email address is on this slide. Thank you again to our amazingly productive analytical team who are shown on this slide. Everything we have presented today is their product. Thank you. All right, um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, Em and I will be reviewing some recent progress in the genetics of the basis of substitute disorders. And much of which we'll talk about today is based on a recent review paper that we wrote together. All right, um, so today's talk will largely cover um, what substitute disorders are and how we define them, um, the epidemiology and the genetic epidemiology of substance use disorders, recent progress in substance use disorders, genome wide association studies, uh, and then some conclusions to propose next steps. And so what are substance use disorders? Um, substance use disorders are psychiatric disorders that frequently co-occur with many other mental health conditions. Um, these can be assessed when receiving a variety of substance classes, including substances that are often described as illicit substances, such as alcohol and nicotine, as well as illicit substances, such as cannabis, opiates, and cocaine. Um, problematic substance use can result in a variety of negative consequences, including death as a result of consuming the substance itself, or what we call overdose, as well as indirect consequences, such as being involved in a traffic-related accident or experiencing health-related issues and disease as a result of long-term use. Um, and as we'll talk more about here shortly, substance use disorders are influenced by both genetic and environmental factors. And so on the previous slide, we mentioned some adverse health uh, issues related to substance use. And here's a quick example of what this might look like for one substance category, here being alcohol use. And so these are figures from the Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health released in 2018 that reported an estimated 5.3% of all deaths worldwide are attributable in some fashion to alcohol consumption. Um, the pie chart below breaks down these 3 million deaths into different causes, um, where we can see that nearly 21% of these deaths are due to alcohol related injury, and approximately 40% due to digestive disease, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And so we can see that alcohol use and misuse is having a large impact on the population worldwide and that is doing so in a variety of ways. And so moving on from the negative consequences to how we define substance use disorders. And so substance use disorders are defined by the DSM-5 as the presence of at least two or 11 criteria within a 12 month period with disorder severity indexed by the number of criteria endorsed, um, two to three for mild, four to five for moderate, and six or more for severe. And broadly speaking, um, substance use disorder criteria correspond to the presence of different substance related problems and can be assessed in relation to a variety of substance classes, including alcohol, nicotine, cannabis, opiates, and cocaine. And so, as I mentioned a couple slides back, substance use disorders can be influenced by both genetic and environmental factors, and these influences are dynamic in that they interact, either increase or decrease one's risk for developing the use disorder. Um, and these factors can be influential across all stages of substance use disorder development. Um, for example, environmental factors such as peer influences, familial environment, socioeconomic status, stressful life events, and co occurring mental uh, health or, or health conditions can all serve as environmental risk factors, while positive peer networks, supportive family environments, and greater socioeconomic advantage can all be protective against development disorder. 
Similarly, genetic influences can also contribute to elevated risk, as well as service with protective role. Um, and so it's also important to note that substance use disorders are highly polygenic in nature, meaning that no one gene is necessarily more sufficient to result in the development of the disorder by itself. And so how can we study the genetics of substance use disorders? Early efforts focused on twin and family studies that demonstrated heritability, heritability estimates um, that say genetic influences account for approximately 50% of the risk for developing a substance use disorder. And that in addition to the substance specific influences, there are also heritable factors that contribute to substance use disorders more broadly. In molecular genetic studies, we are studying specific points of variation, or what are called polymorphisms. Advancements in genome wide association studies have allowed us to reliably go across the genome, and look at measurements of these specific points of variation, and see if these are related to a trait of interest, in our situation being substance use disorders. Um, a similar uh, story has emerged what was found for early twin family studies where there appear to be substance specific variants um, that emerge for molecular genetic studies of substance use disorders as well as pleiotropic variants that influence susceptibility for many psychiatric traits. All right so now we'll talk a bit about some progress that have been made for substance use disorders. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about alcohol and nicotine and then Emma will walk you through some other initial studies. And so alcohol dependence and alcohol use disorder is a great example to demonstrate the progress that we've made in the past few years. So this figure is from one of the first full powered studies of alcohol dependence. And the better oriented to it, um, this is what is called the Manhattan plot. And we'll see a series of these on the next handful of slides. So here on the x-axis, uh, we have chromosomal position across the 22 autosomal chromosomes. And on the y-axis, we have a negative log 10 of the p-value. And then these plotted data points correspond to the individual variant associations with the trait that we're interested in studying. So basically, what I'm thinking here is that smaller p-values are going to correspond to these higher points in the plot. Um, in general, we're looking for a 5 times 10 to negative 8 for a variant to be deemed genome-wide significant. Uh, but really, what we're looking for are these towers to emerge, which alcohol dependence does a really nice job of demonstrating for us here on previous before. So as I mentioned, this was one of the first low-powered uh, substance use disorder GWAS for alcohol dependence. And here we see that this lone tower emerges on, in the ADH1B region of chromosome 4 with a p-value of 9.8 times 10 to the negative 13. So this study had about 11,500 individuals of European ancestry that were diagnosed with alcohol dependence. And so that was the biggest then. Um, let's take a look at the biggest now. And so this is currently the largest GWAS study of alcohol use, um, which was a meta-analysis of problematic alcohol use in approximately 435,000 individuals. And so one thing I'll point out here is that on the previous slide, we were seeing the most significant variant with a p-value of 9.8 times 10 to the negative 13. Um, and that was the only tower that was emerging. But now with more samples, what we're seeing, uh, we're seeing many more peaks, including signals that were now called metabolizing gene of chromosome 4 that have increased in magnitude substantially. Um, and we also are see, starting to see additional associations emerge in genes, such as what we see over here on chromosome 2 in the glucokinase regulator gene. Um, which encodes the regulatory protein involved with glucose metabolism and liver cells. All right, so transitioning to nicotine and tobacco use. Um, here are initial findings from the largest GWAS and nicotine dependence to date, um, here being assessed by FT and D scores. Um, this study included 58,000 smokers. And so for nicotine dependence and studies of other smoking phenotypes, such as cigarettes per day or regular smoking, um, there's a robust association with genetic variants within a cluster of nicotine and acetylcholine receptor genes on chromosome 15. Um, that includes the CHRNA5 gene, um, which is also um, more specifically replicated the variant RS1696968, which here had a p-value of 1.6 times 10 to negative 39. So these are the most pronounced results from the continuum dependence to date, um, but prior studies have found a similar overall pattern of results. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand things off to Emma to tell us about what's been found for other synthesis disorders. Thanks, Joe. Here I'm going to present a Manhattan plot, and this is showing the results of the largest GWAS of cannabis use disorder to date. This GWAS combined data from the PGC, iPsych, and Decode Genetics, and included about 20,000 cases and just over 360,000 controls. And this GWAS of cannabis use disorder identified two significant loci. There's a locus on chromosome 7, where the lead risk variant is in an intron of the FOXP2 gene. And there's also a significant locus on chromosome 8. And this locus was previously identified by DeMontis et al. in the iSEC data and replicated in the DECODE data. 
And the lead risk variant here is an EQTL for CHRNA2 in the cerebellum, as well as EPHX2 in the cerebellum and adipose tissue. I also want to point out some other results from this GWAS of cannabis use disorder. And this was just recently accepted in the Lancet Psychiatry. Um, and here we're contrasting the genetic correlations between cannabis use disorder and a number of relevant traits and cannabis initiation and the same traits. As you can see, there's some divergence when we look at the genetic correlations of cannabis use disorder versus cannabis initiation or ever use. I'm pointing out three in particular here. For body mass index, we see that cannabis use disorder is significantly positively correlated with body mass index. When we look at age at birth of the first child, we see that cannabis use disorder is significantly correlated with an earlier age at first birth. And it is also significantly negatively correlated with educational attainment. When we look at cannabis initiation, we see that there's actually significant correlations with these three traits, but then the opposite direction of effect. And actually, for 12 of the 22 traits that we tested, those marked with an asterisk, we see significantly different genetic correlations when we look at cannabis initiation versus cannabis use disorder. Moving on to opioid use disorder, this is the latest and largest GWAS of opioid use disorder. And this combined data from the MVP, Yale Penn, and SAGE. This is by Hong Zhou et al. And they identified a significant functional coding variant within the mu opioid receptor gene, or OPRM1. I also want to point out some interesting results from an earlier GWAS of opioid dependence, and this is by Renato Polamonti et al. He looked at a PRS for risk tolerance or a polygenic risk score um, for risk tolerance and a polygenic risk score for neuroticism. And if we look at the risk tolerance PRS, Renato saw significant associations with two of the contrasts that he tested. So he saw that the risk tolerance PRS was significantly associated when he compared individuals with opioid dependence to unexposed controls, and when he compared exposed controls to unexposed controls. If we look at the neuroticism PRS, we see that Renato saw significant associations with the opioid dependent individuals and unexposed controls contrast, and the contrast of opioid dependent individuals and exposed controls. So this suggests that risk tolerance or externalizing behaviors may be more associated with exposure, while something like neuroticism and negative affect may be more associated with uh, dependence than simply exposure. Moving on to cocaine. Uh, cocaine use disorder has had much smaller sample sizes than for other substance use disorders um, and fewer GWAS and little replication to date. But what I'm showing here is um, one of the largest studies published to date. And this is from uh, Spencer Huggett and Mike Stallings. And here they're actually taking GWAS summary statistics from an earlier study by Galerner et al. But here they're conducting a gene-wise association in both the European Americans and the African-American sample. And they identified this novel significant gene, NDUFB9, in the African-American sample. Spencer has also done some interesting work comparing human genetic studies to mouse models. Um, and here I'm showing a figure from a recent paper of his um, looking at overlap of differentially expressed genes and gene networks when they compared uh, human cases of cocaine use disorder to a mouse model of cocaine self-administration. And they do see significant genetic overlap, suggesting that some of these uh, animal models might be useful for studying substance use disorders, at least in the case of cocaine dependence. Joe mentioned earlier that twin and family studies have identified um, some common genetic factors shared amongst substance use disorders more broadly. And we see this mirrored when we look at genome-wide data. So here I'm presenting a figure on the right, and this is from a paper by Jang et al. I do want to note that um, here we're looking at substance use traits or substance initiation, such as lifetime cannabis use, whether someone has ever reported um, being a regular smoker. So these aren't substance use disorders per se, um, but they are correlated with substance use disorders. <clears throat> 
And we do see genetic correlations between and among substance use disorders as well as substance use traits starting at around 0.5 and higher. So we do see these genetic correlations mirrored um, in the molecular genetic literature. We also see that substance use disorders, and in this case, substance use traits, are correlated with other psychiatric disorders. So in the cannabis use disorder, GWAS, we saw a significant uh, genetic correlation with post-traumatic stress disorder. Alcohol use disorder and major depression are significantly correlated. And with opioid use disorder, we see a significant genetic correlation with ADHD. So what's next for the substance use genetics field? In our review paper, we outlined three key areas that we see as priorities for our field for the next few years going forward. The first of these priorities is increasing the diversity of samples that we include in our GWAS. So most of the GWAS that we presented today, and certainly the largest GWAS to date for substance use and substance use disorders, have primarily included individuals of European ancestry. And it's been shown that when discovery GWAS only include individuals of European descent, polygenic risk scores that are derived from those GWAS have limited utility in target samples of other diverse populations. So we really need to increase the diversity of individuals that we're including in our discovery GWAS. The second priority that we outline is the incorporation of incorporation of diverse types of multiomics data, as well as extension to cross-species data. So in terms of multiomics data, for example, GTEx is a great resource and one that a lot of us use in conducting follow-up analyses for our GWAS. However, we really need substance-specific data. So gene expression data sets um, after substance exposure or substance use disorders. Finally, the third priority that we outline is the refinement of phenotypes and ascertainment strategies. So I, as I mentioned earlier, um, in terms of cannabis use versus cannabis use disorder, we do see some divergence um, for some of the substances that we've talked about today in terms of use versus use disorder or problematic use. So for cannabis, there's some, been some evidence of this. There's also been some evidence of this for alcohol. So when we compare alcohol use disorder to drinks per week, or some other measure of perhaps more typical alcohol consumption. But we really need to do a better job of um, determining whether these phenotypes really show these diverse um, genetic backgrounds, or if there's something about the ascertainment strategy that is uh, causing us to see these interesting and um, sometimes paradoxical genetic correlations when we look at use versus use disorder. Finally, um, in our review paper, we tried to address the question, can we translate any of these substance use or substance use disorder GWAS findings to the clinic yet? And the answer is, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Particularly with substance use and substance use disorders, um, we really don't have the sample sizes or the robust findings and power that we need yet to be able to use something like a polygenic risk score in a clinical setting. So polygenic risk scores at the moment explain such a small amount of variance um, in target samples that that percent variance explained really isn't at a clinically, clinically meaningful level yet, um, but we hope to get there one day. And there may be other strategies such as pharmacogenetics or drug repurposing, repositioning strategies that may help us translate these GWAS findings to the clinic eventually. Thanks for uh, checking out our video. And we would like to mention that if you're interested in working with us more, to better understand the genetics of substance use disorders, please see our PGC website. There's information there and you can contact um, the, any of the co-PIs of the Substance Use Disorders Working Group. We would love to work with you. Thanks. A few quick words about ancestry-specific loci, in this case, ADH1B. Hi, I'm Howard Edenberg from Indiana University. Alcohol metabolism is fairly simple. The alcohol we drink gets converted into acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenases, and the acetaldehyde is removed by aldehyde dehydrogenases into acetate. Acetaldehyde is nasty stuff, and excess acetaldehyde is aversive. There are two different variations in the ADH1B gene that encodes one of the alcohol dehydrogenases, both of which increase the rate of formation of acetaldehyde. They don't lead to a severe flushing reaction, but nonetheless, they do offer partial protection 
against alcohol use disorders. The first of these variants, RS1229984, reduces the risk for alcohol use disorders about threefold. It has a pretty whopping effect. This is a very common allele in East Asia, present at 70 to 75% frequency in Han Chinese and Japanese. It's present at a lower frequency, 15 to 20%, in populations from the Near East, much less common in Europe, between zero and 6% in different countries, and extremely rare in Africa. There's another protective ADH1B variant, RS2066702, that also reduces the risk for alcohol use disorders, although by a smaller amount. This is moderately common in Africa, between about 9 and 28% allele frequencies in different populations around the continent, very rare elsewhere. So what principles does this point out? Differences in allele frequencies, even of functional variants like these, are fairly common. Differences in the environment are also common. But human biology is pretty similar across different populations. If we learn about a key pathway in one population, it's very likely to act similarly in another population. And we could potentially target that pathway even in populations that don't have the variant that led us to discover this. But environments also vary and can affect the impact of any one variant. So among the things we learn from this are that when we're looking at different disorders, we need to look broadly across many populations. We need to do GWAS across many populations and take both the genetics and the environment into effect, into account. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Han Zhou from Yale. Today I'm going to talk about two topics. The first is AUD differs from use genetically. This is a major discovery from the large GWAS error. There is a theme of PGC SUD group, that is, substance use disorder is different from substance use. We did GWAS in the median veteran program for two traits. The first is use disorder, the second is ODC, which is a measurement for use. And later we did comparison for those two traits. MVP is an idea data set for this analysis because it's single cohort with large sample size. It has multiple ancestries and it has longitudinal measurements from HR and it contains both RDC and AUD diagnosis. In this study, we found that AUD differs from RDC genetically. The up panel is the genetic correlation between RDC and other traits. The bottom panel is the genetic correlation between AUD and other traits. We can see there is a clear uh, differences between those two patterns. AUD is positively correlated with a lot of psychiatric disorder, sleeping disorder, and smoking behaviors. However, there's no genetic correlation between RDC and those two those traits. Even there is a negative gen uh, genetic correlation between RDC and major depression. There are, there are uh, other few traits shows opposite uh, direction for the genetic correlation between uh, RDC and a AUD. It's indicated that AUD and RDC are totally different traits. And this study was published in uh, last year. A similar pattern was observed between RDC and RDP, which, which is a measurement for drinking problems. It's published by Sandra last year. So we were thinking whether can we do the proxy phenotype meta-analysis for AUD and RDP. And we label it as problematic echo use. So we combine data from MVP, PGC, UK per bank, cover three traits, echo use disorder, echo dependence, and audit P. Genetic correlation analysis shows that those three traits are highly correlated. So we did the proxy phenotype meta-analysis. The total sum size is almost half million. And this study was published uh, this year. The genetic correlation pattern for PAU is very close to the genetic pattern for AUD, and it's very different from the uh, pattern for echo use reported in GSCAN or our previous Odyssey studies. So in conclusion, 
AUD differs from LQUs genetically, and we did the largest meta-analysis for PAU. Of course, we need more data from non-European populations for similar analysis. The second topic is comorbid AUD and major depression. Significant lifetime occurrence of AUD and major depression were reported. There must be a lot of shared genetic or environment factors. So we aim to detect the shared genetic factors. The first study was um, PRS analysis. The PRS, PRS for major depression is associated with alcohol use, use disorder in four different data sets. So it indicates that shared genetic susceptibility contribute to both traits. And this study was published three years ago. A second study was a GWAS for comorbid AUD and major depression. We tested the hypothesis that whether there is a shared risk variance contribute to the comorbid severity. There was only one figure detected in European African Americans. And this study was published three years ago. So there's a lot of things need to be done. So we have future plans for this comorbidity. The first is joint analysis for AUD and major depression based on summary statistics. Given that we have published the largest AUD and PAU GWAS, and this largest GWAS of depression is coming soon, made by Daniel Levy. And the second is we'll do joint analysis using individual level data in MVP. Hopefully we can find more shared risk variants. And I would like to thank all the participants, all the collaborators, and thank you all. A brief note about ancestry-specific loci, in this case, ALDH2. Hi, I'm Howard Edenberg from Indiana University. Alcohol metabolism is relatively simple. The alcohol you drink gets converted by alcohol dehydrogenases into acetaldehyde, and the acetaldehyde is removed by conversion into acetate by aldehyde dehydrogenases. That intermediate compound, acetaldehyde, tends to be aversive. It causes, when it's in excess, what's been called a flushing reaction. Facial flushing is the most obvious sign of this, but it also includes nausea, vomiting, headaches, high pulse rate. It's in general quite aversive. There's a protective variant in the gene called ALDH2, which encodes a mitochondrial aldehyde dehydrogenase primarily responsible for getting rid of the acetaldehyde. RS671 leads to a nearly inactive enzyme. What that means is that consuming alcohol, if you have one copy of this variant, leads to a strong flushing reaction. This is aversive and reduces drinking. And because it reduces the amount you can consume, it reduces your risk for alcohol dependence. This variant is present at different frequencies in different populations. It's at moderately high frequencies in Asian populations, 25 to 30% of Han Chinese and Japanese carry at least one of these alleles and therefore are partially protected against alcoholism. It's extremely rare outside East Asia with frequencies near zero in European, African and American populations. This illustrates a couple of principles. Differences in allele frequency across different populations are fairly common, as are differences in the environment, and both need to be taken into account. But the basic biology is pretty similar among different populations. Humans are pretty much humans. If we learn of a key pathway in one population, it's likely to also be similar in the others, and we can target that pathway even if the variants are rare. In this case, there's a drug, disulfiram or antabuse, which inhibits the same ALDH2 enzyme as that variant does, causes the same kind of flushing and aversive reaction in people who take the drug, and has been used in order to keep, treat people for alcohol use disorders. It's also important to note that the environment can often override even strong genetic effects. A heavy drinking environment in Japan that developed in recent decades has led some people, even with this protective 
allele to drink and suffer the uh, flushing reaction, but lose some of their protection against alcohol use disorders. So I think these are all things we need to keep in mind as we move forward and study the genetics in different populations. I have the pleasure to guide you through, in five minutes, some of the most recent advances in the field of alcohol genetics. Millions of people are affected by drug addiction. It is one of the commonest psychiatric disorders and a leading cause of disability throughout the world. And it is many of us that we are chasing the genetic basis of substance use disorders with the hope that this will enable new treatments and diagnostic tools. And to study this complex condition, we are using different study designs. And the first one is the study of disease populations. And genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, in disease populations have served as a gold standard. In 2018, the PGC Substance Use Disorder Workgroup performed a GWAS of alcohol dependence, which robustly implicated the well-studied ethanol metabolizing enzyme gene on chromosome 4. A second complementary study design is the use of intermediate phenotypes, which allows us to break down aspects of alcohol, as I will be focusing on today, but substance use disorders more generally, into specific components or transitions, as I represent in this slide. And this is important because substance use disorders develop in a chronological fashion, from experimental to regular use, dependence, relapse, and approaching substance use disorders with a case control framework merges the genetic liability for each of these stages into a single phenotype, obscuring the distinct biological factors that may be relevant at each stage. And it is possible that different genes may impact or have a different role at different stages. Only over the past five years, there has been an explosion of GWAS that have used this approach and we have now begun to unravel hundreds of loci associated with aspects of alcohol involvement. For example, we can measure aspects of alcohol use using a very rapid 10 item questionnaire audit. It can be measured in the general population and the beauty is that it can dissect alcohol use from misuse. For example, the first three items capture consumption whereas the remaining items capture problematic consequences of alcohol use. And we recently used a multivariate framework which allowed us to study the genetic basis of each of the 10 different phenotypes from audit, which was measured in three cohorts primarily from the UK biobank that is not a disease population. And with this method, we constructed two latent factors, consumption on the left and problems on the right. And we can see that even though they are genetically correlated, they are best represented by distinct entities. This was also evidenced in a GWAS of the latent phenotypes of consumption at the top and problems at the bottom, which we can see that even though there is some genetic overlap, especially in ethanol metabolizing enzyme genes on chromosome 4, the overlap is not complete, suggesting that alcohol consumption and misuse have a distinct genetic basis. We also identified that the genetic signature of problems in dark blue was more strongly genetically associated with psychopathology than consumption was, again revealing that the polygenic architecture of the two factors is different and emphasizing the value of deconstructing such two core symptoms of alcohol use disorders. We also found that consumption and problems were both strongly, very strongly indeed, genetically correlated with an independent clinical study of alcohol dependence performed by the PGC, as I showed in the opening slides. And these findings are extremely important because in a recent GWAS of alcohol use disorders that combine data from electronic health records from the Million Veterans Program and data from Audit P from UK Biobank, as I'm showing in this slide, allows us, uh, allowed us to identify 29 risk variants. And our new findings are indeed powerful because they suggest that we could also use consumption phenotypes for future meta-analysis of alcohol use disorders, reaching unprecedented sample sizes that could place substance use disorders at a similar rate of discovery than other more successfully approached psychiatric conditions via GWAS, such as schizophrenia or major depression. <laughs> 
In closing, I have shown today that alcohol use disorders are extremely polygenic and will necessitate even larger sample sizes than the ones that we have at hand. Ascertainment strategies, including data from electronic health records or the study of intermediate phenotypes will complement more traditional strategies to enable gene discovery. For example, using intermediate phenotypes such as audits, we have begun to relatively inexpensively annotate the addiction cycle, and we showed that consumption and misuse phenotypes have a distinct genetic basis. Lastly, the use of intermediate phenotypes is of value because it can enable translational research and provide a more granular biological understanding of substance use disorder, which is currently lacking, to enable actionable new breakthroughs in the years to come. A quick note about small effect sizes. Hi, I'm Howard Edenberg from Indiana University. Psychiatric and substance use disorders are complex genetic disorders. That means risk is affected by genetics, by the environment, and by the interactions between them. No one gene causes a psychiatric or substance use disorder. Instead, variations in many genes lead to variations in physiology that interact with the environment to lead to variations in risk, variations in the course of a disorder, and variations in response to treatment. The effect of any one variant is small. That's led some to ask, why bother looking for loci of such small effects? What will we learn? The answer is that genetics will lead us to a better understanding of the biology of the disorder, the genes and the pathways that are involved. This will allow us to better diagnose people. It'll give us rational targets for drug de development, and it'll eventually lead to much better personalized medicine. It's important to note that the effect of a drug is not in any way limited by the effect size of the variant that led us to understand the disorder. Even if the effect size of a variant is small, a drug can target the gene or pathway involved and have a very large effect. So I continue to believe that GWAS, ever larger GWAS of more different populations, will lead us to a better understanding of the biology of these disorders and will eventually give us the information we need to better treat these devastating disorders. Thank you. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing research on a joint collaboration between the Eating Disorders and Substance Use Disorders Working Group at the PGC. The prevalence of substance use disorders is highest among individuals with a history of bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa with the binge eating purging subtype. Comorbid eating disorders and substance use disorders complicates treatment. For example, it's associated with increased general medical conditions, psychopathology, and relapse rates. Unfortunately, few specialist centers are able to treat these disorders simultaneously. Therefore, it is imperative that we understand the etiology, including shared genetic risk, between eating disorders and substance use disorder comorbidity so that we can reduce the negative consequences associated with these disorders. In recent years, twin studies have demonstrated that there is a significant genetic correlation that ranges from 0.2 to 0.5 for uh, eating disorders and substance use disorders. The majority of these studies have focused on bulimia nervosa or binge eating and have found that the most significant association occurs between these eating disorder phenotypes with problematic drinking, including alcohol use disorder. Although a handful of studies have examined other substances, including nicotine and illicit drugs as a group, it is unclear the extent to which findings generalize across substances or may be specific within illicit drug categories, as well as whether they extend to multiple levels of involvement, ranging from initiation to problematic use. Therefore, in the first study on this collaboration between the two working groups, we estimated genetic correlations between multiple eating disorder and substance use related phenotypes. To do this, we use linkage disequilibrium score regression for our primary analysis, which includes uh, using GWAS summary statistics to obtain these genetic correlations between two phenotypes. 
We used case control samples and examined four eating disorder and eight substance use related phenotypes from eight different GWAS. Sample sizes per phenotype range from 2,400 to 537,000 individuals. SNPs included in the HapMap3 European subpopulation were used to estimate LD and to correct for multiple testing, we used false discovery rate. Here's a heat map of the results. The orange square, sorry, the blue squares uh, illustrate uh, uh, genetic, positive genetic correlations, so same genes, same direction of effect. Red squares denote negative genetic correlations, so same genes, opposite direction of effect. And although we found significant genetic correlations within the eating disorder phenotypes and within the substance use um, related phenotypes, I'm only going to discuss those between the two classes of disorders. Importantly, three intriguing findings or patterns emerged. First, there was a significant genetic correlation between anorexia nervosa and alcohol use disorder of 0.18. Um, and when we broke anorexia nervosa sample into those with binge eating and those without binge eating, we found a, uh, although non-significant, we found a point estimate of the genetic correlation between anorexia nervosa with binge eating subtype and alcohol use disorder to be very similar to that with the full anorexia nervosa sample. However, the anorexia nervosa without binge eating alcohol use disorder genetic correlation was zero. This suggests the importance of um, binge eating as an important symptom in this association, as well as uh, examining problematic alcohol use rather than typical alcohol consumption. The second pattern was that there was a significant genetic correlation between our anorexia nervosa and the with binge eating subtype uh, with cannabis initiation. However, we did not find significant genetic correlations between these two eating disorder phenotypes and cannabis use disorder. Finally, we found significant negative genetic correlations between the anorexia nervosa without binge eating subtype and three indices of smoking, um, but not with nicotine dependence. This is the largest and most comprehensive analysis of shared genetic risk for eating disorders and substance use disorders. And our findings highlight that there are partially divergent etiologies between these two classes of disorders. There's a significant positive genetic correlation between problematic alcohol use with anorexia nervosa, but not with typical alcohol consumption. These findings are consistent with existing literature showing that there are differences between typical alcohol consumption and problematic alcohol use when we examine genetic correlations and psychopathologies with the problematic alcohol use showing the stronger genetic correlations. Furthermore, this association could be driven by binge eating. However, we need GWA samples of bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder in order to investigate this further. Second, we found a significant positive genetic correlation between cannabis use and anorexia nervosa, in particular with the binge eating subtype these findings are consistent with existing data uh, between cannabis use and body mass index, as well as the role that endocannabinoids play in appetite regulation. It's possible that the positive genetic correlation is a result of the acute effects of cannabis use on appetite regulation, and that interactions with the endocannabinoid system may be associated with anorexia nervosa via metabolic pathways. Finally, our we found a significant negative genetic correlation between nicotine use and anorexia nervosa without binge eating. Although phenotypic studies show a positive association between nicotine dependence and anorexia nervosa, it's important to note that this phenotypic correlation or positive phenotypic correlation does not mean that a genetic correlation must be present or that it must be uh, in the same direction. It's possible that a third variable may be explain the association, this particular association, 
For example, positive genetic correlations exist between smoking and cardiometabolic traits, whereas negative genetic correlations exist between anorexia nervosa and these same cardiometabolic traits. From this information, uh, we can use genomics to understand eating disorder and substance use disorder comorbidity in three ways. First, uh, this study and having a high genetic correlation provides information on which individuals may be more vulnerable to develop eating disorders and specific substance use disorders, um, especially among those with a family history of either disorder. Second, this information can help patients and their families understand how difficult recovery can be from either disorder or both disorders, especially when they are fighting an uphill battle with their biology. And having genetic risk for both of these disorders could make that hill a little steeper or more difficult to climb. Finally, if there is a high genetic correlation, then treatment, especially pharmacological treatment for one disorder may aid in recovery from the other disorder. Ongoing collaborations between the eating disorders and substance use disorders working groups using ro robust and rigorous genomic approaches will provide critical insight into these areas in the coming years. I wanna thank the funding agencies including the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in the US, Cindy Bulock, Arpana Agarwal, Emma Johnson, the many investigators who shared their data and the participants who donated DNA. Thank you. Predicting the likelihood of future psychiatric disorders sounds like a great idea, but there are some cautions. Let's take a closer look. Hi, I'm Howard Edenberg from Indiana University School of Medicine. Psychiatric disorders are complex genetic disorders. That means that the risk involves genetics, the environment, and the interaction between them. We're only beginning to identify the genetic variations that affect risk. At present, the common variants we can measure taken across the whole genome explain only a small fraction of the risk, perhaps 10% of the risk of, in something like an alcohol use disorder. But there have been companies that claim tremendous accuracy in predicting risk. One of these is a test for the risk of opioid dependence designed to be given by a doctor before he or she treats someone for severe pain. This is based on 15 or 16 genetic variants and uses a machine learning approach. We took a close look at this. We found many problems with the claims. The first is that the chosen SNPs, which are meant to represent the reward pathway in the brain, differed in their minor allele frequencies among populations. This is always a caution when you're trying to do genetics. We tested and found that randomly selected SNPs that had similar minor allele frequencies did just as well as these supposed reward system SNPs. And we found that either the chosen SNPs or our random SNPs predicted genetic ancestry better than they predicted opioid dependence. So what are the potential hazards of such a premature and in this case inaccurate test? Well, the first is the inaccurate prediction itself. This may lead to under treatment of pain it may also lead to increased medical discrimination against minorities because what the test was picking out was minority status. It may also stigmatize people who are labeled as likely to become opioid dependent, and that has great costs also. We've taken a closer look at this, and you can see more details in an article on MedArchive that goes into some of what we did here. But again, this is a caution for prematurely trying to predict risk when we still understand so little about these disorders. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm here to present our phenome-wide genetic correlation and causality for COVID-19 severity phenotype highlights some of the substance use disorder. This is a PGC 
independent investigator study. So as we know, um, COVID-19 um, caused by the uh, new SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, has been shown to be highly transmissible. It has uh, several uh, uh, high uh, severe symptomology. And to understand this uh, process, the COVID host genetics initiative has been uh, meta-analyzing genotype data um, to better understand some of the genetic polymorphisms associated with COVID. Um, and in this figure, uh, we see the latest Manhattan plot for the study for the A2 phenotype. It's just coded as A2. It is um, individuals who had very severe respiratory confirmed COVID case versus the population. So this was found to be a heritable um, phenotype. And the second phenotype is uh, individuals who were hospitalized due to COVID versus um, population as control. And this phenotype was also heritable. Uh, so when we look at um, some of the genetic correlations with uh, hospitalized COVID, we see that um, these phenotypes are actually significant. And we came to this uh, information because we performed a phenome-wide um, genetic correlation, and here we have highlighted uh, some of the substance use phenotypes that were found to be significant. Uh, so when we look at the genetic-based latent causal variable analysis, we find that alcohol intake frequency and alcohol drinker status is one of the, or I should say, few of the phenotypes that were uh, that had a significant causality relationship with COVID-19. Uh, in this uh, figure, we are um, doing uh, showing a genetic correlation of A2, which is the severe respiratory symptoms uh, versus the population. So when we perform genetic correlation between several of the substance phenotypes, we see mostly uh, tobacco smoking or smoking and alcohol, uh, substance use disorders or substance use traits are significant than others uh, present. Sorry. Uh, and then when we perform the causality, we see some of the, again, even for um, severe respiratory phenotype of COVID, the alcohol is one of the uh, significant phenotypes which has a, a causal component with COVID. Uh, we also perform this uh, with the uh, cannabis use disorder, the latest uh, study published by PGC. And as you can see, it is very significant. However, the genetic uh, causal proportion is very low. So uh, it's really important to treat these findings as preliminary. And Alex Hatum from Dr. Arpana Agarwal's lab is uh, working on teasing apart this relationship and please check out uh, his work uh, uh, coming up in the future. Uh, with that, um, thank you for listening to us and we appreciate our funding support and um, collaborators. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for stopping by our video. We're really excited today to talk to you about some of the most recent research on cannabis and schizophrenia. I'm Emma and in a little bit, you'll hear more from Marta DeForti. I would like to thank the Substance Use Disorders Working Group of the PGC who has supported these projects, as well as funding from NIAAA, NIDA, and NIMH. And of course, my wonderful collaborators, Marta and Robin. Schizophrenia is a very serious debilitating disorder. And one of the most frequent comorbidities that we see with schizophrenia is that of heavy or even dependent cannabis use. Trying to understand the reasons behind this comorbidity is one of the longest standing research questions in the psychiatry community. Today, I'm gonna to talk about two of the most common theories for why we see this comorbidity. The first is that there's some sort of a causal relationship between heavy cannabis use and schizophrenia, whereby heavy cannabis use directly increases your risk of developing schizophrenia or having a psychotic episode. The other theory is that cannabis use and schizophrenia share some sort of genetic vulnerability. So a genetic variant that increases your risk of developing cannabis use disorder, say, may also directly increase the risk of developing schizophrenia. 
Some of the earliest studies that found evidence of causality looked at Swedish conscripts, and they found that those who used cannabis heavily had a much higher risk of developing schizophrenia compared to individuals who did not use cannabis. In terms of shared genetic predisposition, Power et al. found some evidence of this when they saw that increased genetic liability for schizophrenia was associated with increased cannabis use. And other studies have found significant genetic correlations between both cannabis initiation and cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia. Importantly, I wanna point out that these two theories are not mutually exclusive. So cannabis and schizophrenia may share some genetic influences. There may also be some sort of a causal relationship there. So these two things can exist at the same time. It just makes parsing those relationships a little bit more complicated and nuanced. So to try and better understand this question, I'm going to present to you two genetically informed analyses that we've conducted. In the first, we use genomic structural equation modeling to model the relationships between genetic liability to cannabis initiation, cannabis use disorder, schizophrenia, and two smoking phenotypes. Now, tobacco use is a behavior that also frequently co-occurs with both cannabis as well as schizophrenia, and it's genetically correlated with both of those behaviors as well. So we thought it was important to include tobacco smoking in our analysis. The second analysis that I'm going to present today is something called a latent causal variable approach. And we use this to test for genetically causal relationships between cannabis and schizophrenia. And the key idea here is that this particular approach allows us to test for partial or full genetic causality, even in the presence accounting for potential genetic correlations between those two traits. All the analyses I'm going to present today use the largest genome-wide data sets available to us, including a large GWAS meta-analysis of cannabis use disorder that was just recently accepted in the Lancet Psychiatry. Here are the results of our genomic structural equation modeling. And what I'm showing here is that even when we account for the common genetic effects of cannabis initiation or ever use, nicotine dependence and smoking initiation, tobacco smoking initiation, in what we're calling this common latent uh, other substance factor. Cannabis use disorder, even though it's highly correlated with this latent factor, still shows a unique, significant, positive association with genetic liability to schizophrenia, even after accounting for these other um, substance use behaviors. When we look at our latent causal variable results, um, let me orient you to this table. So first we have our trait one. So here are our cannabis phenotypes, cannabis use disorder, or cannabis initiation or ever use, and schizophrenia is trait two. And here I'm presenting what is called the genetic causality proportion. So this is the proportion of trait one's genetic component that is also causal for trait two. This p-value is the p-value for the null hypothesis that the genetic causality proportion equals zero. So there's no genetic causality between cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia or cannabis use and schizophrenia or vice versa. And we see that we can't reject this null hypothesis. So in other words, we're not really finding any evidence of genetic causality between these traits here. However, when we look at the genetic correlation or the R sub G, between cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia and cannabis initiation in schizophrenia, we see modest but significant genetic correlations. So in other words, we're seeing significant genetic correlations, but not really any evidence of genetic causality here. In summary, genetic liability for cannabis use disorder shows a unique positive association with schizophrenia liability, even when we account for two tobacco smoking phenotypes and cannabis initiation. We found little evidence of a genetically causal relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia. Our results seem more consistent with something called horizontal pleiotropy. This is where a genetic variant may directly increase risk for cannabis use disorder, and it also directly increases risk for schizophrenia. This is uh, different from something called vertical pleiotropy. So vertical pleiotropy is where, say, a genetic variant increases risk for cannabis use disorder, 
and then indirectly increases risk for schizophrenia, but only via the causal relationship between cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia. So in other words, our results are more consistent with horizontal pleiotropy and genetic correlations between cannabis use disorder and schizophrenia or shared genetic predisposition between these two traits than a causal relationship. Thanks. I'll hand it over to Marta now. It is a great privilege for me to follow from Emma's wonderful presentation. I'm Marta Di Forsi. I'm an MRC Senior Clinical Fellow and a Consultant Psychiatrist working in the UK. And why am I collaborating with Emma and the Substance Use Disorder PGC? Well, because over the last decade, I've been very preoccupied with the association between heavy cannabis use, in particular use of high potency types, with psychotic disorder and schizophrenia. And recently, with my research team, we published some data from the UGI study, which is a collaboration of many European sites, including one from Brazil. And we show that the variation in the incidence rates for psychotic disorder across the study sites, which is the red line, strongly correlated with the green line that represents the prevalence of high potency cannabis use in the population control, which were specifically recruited to be representative of the population of each site. And as you can see, the two sites with the highest prevalence of use of high potency cannabis are also two among those with the highest rates of psychotic disorder. And you can see that this message was taken very seriously by our queen, which is part of the population of one of the sites, London. And now when she receives a sample of cannabis, she makes sure that she sniffs it to exclude a skunk. A skunk is the high potency cannabis you find in London. And as the name tells, has got a very strong pungent smell. But what about the role that the genetic schizophrenia plays in shaping this association? So in this analysis, I show how even after controlling for schizophrenia PRS, the odds ratio for daily use of high potency cannabis not only remains significant, but indicates a five-fold increase in the odds of developing a psychotic disorder. And when we look at the combined effects of the two, we see that with an increase in schizophrenia PRS, along the x-axis, we have an increase of probability to suffer from a psychotic disorder for each line, which indicate different patterns of cannabis use with the top line represented frequent use of high potency types. This work, of course, has been possible thanks to the funding of the MRC and the NIHR and the extraordinary collaboration with Catherine Lewis, Robin Murray, Evangelos Vasses, Diego Quattrone, the UGI team, and least but not last, my wonderful patients and their family. And it's thanks to new exceptional collaboration that I will be able to move forward with the genetics and epigenetics, even adding an animal model analysis with the work that I'm interested in. And this is again, is all inspired and motivated by my weekly interaction with the patient with first episode psychosis and cannabis use disorder that I meet in my clinic. So thanks to the MRC new funding, uh, in parallel with the work that Emma has described, I plan to focus on genetic pathway analysis and refine the EWA signature for cannabis use. Here there are some preliminary data coming from the work with Emma Dempster. And in a newly recruited sample of current daily cannabis users, they will be exposed to a virtual reality social scenario experiment, I plan to use the genetic pathway scores and the EWAS profiling to explain the expected difference in paranoia response following exposure to the virtual reality social scenario. This virtual reality social scenario are used in uh, uh, general population studies and also studies with patients with psychosis to measure in real time paranoid response to social exposure. And this will happen in my sample, who will be a sample that would include subject with and without a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis of uh, psychosis. And in parallel, we will collect data from an animal model of exposure to cannabis compound, where we will collect uh, genome-wide epigenetic data to compare them with the one from the human data. And to conclude, I would like to share with you 
the experience of my absolutely, our actually absolutely charming cat. Sky is a Scottish fold uh, who has a genetic mutation that influences the development of a cartilage, which is why she has this totally irresistible look and floppy ears. But this also has an impact on uh, the development of her joints and, and, def and of course, on her overall health. But thanks to a controlled diet and a slightly modified environment, she's able to have a very happy and healthy life like a cousin Rob Roy who is the same breed but without the mutation. And this is to remind us all that heavy cannabis use and the use of high potency cannabis remains one of the most modifiable risk factors for psychotic disorder and schizophrenia. And then in London, 30% of new cases of psychotic disorder could be prevented if high potency cannabis was abolished, meaning that for 30% of people, even where genetic is an important factor and other factors have contributed to increase the risk profile for psychosis, high potency cannabis use has been the one that has tipped them over the threshold. And therefore, this should remind us all that while we wait to better understand the genetics, we shouldn't forget the modifying the environment we can impact on disease, incidents and also outcome. Thank you very much for your attention.